a uh, very warm welcome and congratulations on having found a room. It took me 10 minutes, so uh, you are clearly very clever. Um, I have um, the uh, privilege, and um, I think it's going to be fun actually, not only a privilege, to moderate uh, this session on uh, which talks about uh, multilateral development banks and how they address uh, corruption risks and how they help uh, multilateral development bank loans go to good use instead of into the hand of um, corrupt people, which I think we all care about hugely. My name is Greta Fenner. I'm the managing director of the Basel Institute on Governance. I have never worked in a multilateral development bank uh, before, but with them in, in various functions. And I've got a brilliant panel, uh, surrounded by a brilliant panel, uh, that's going to take the lead in the discussion. I'll introduce them in a second. I think what's really exciting about this session is we won't have presentations, no PowerPoint, well, PowerPoint slides, but only to help you guide. Uh, but we'll actually have a hypothetical case scenario that we will uh, use to introduce and, and kind of explain and question the work of the Multilateral Development Bank when it comes to corruption prevention. So in alphabetical order in accordance with the name of their banks, um, I have with me, <laughs> I think that's how it is, right? We have uh, Paula Santos uh, da Costa, to my very far right, who's the uh, Director of Integrity and Anti-Corruption at the African Development Bank. To her immediate left is John Versandwort, I hope I pronounced that right, very good, who's the Head of uh, the Office of Anti-Corruption and Integrity at the Asian Development Bank in Manila. To my immediate right, uh, Bernd Trexler, who is the Chief Compliance Officer at EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Turning to my uh, left is uh, Duncan Smith, who is the Deputy Head of Fraud Investigation at the European Investment Bank. I do want to point out that these books are written by Duncan, and those who are interested in the books, they are linked to the panel's content, are most welcome to approach him afterwards. They're really interesting, actually. Uh, on the left of Duncan, we have Laura Profeta, who is the Chief of the Office of Institutional Integrity, Inter-American Development Bank. And to the very far left, last but certainly not least, my old friend, Alan Baccarese, who is now the Director of Investigations, Strategy and Operations for the Integrity Vice Presidency at the World Bank. And it will be interesting because their titles all sound similar but not the same. And so it'll be interesting to see if their approaches to integrity in loans uh, are similar or maybe the same. So in an initial um, first step, uh, we will uh, have a discussion that guides us through a hypothetical case scenario. These are distributed and hopefully you will even able to briefly read through them. I will run you through the case scenario in a couple of you know, around the key parameters, but if you have had a chance to read it, I think that would be even better. And we will uh, use uh, the case scenario in a couple of rounds of questions to talk about issues of uh, due diligence, uh, challenges in investigating corruption allegations, and also consequences of potential uh, findings of impropriety in loans. Um, it'll be two rounds of questions, I think, and finally, of course, we hope that we have also some time for questions and answers and a discussion with the audience. We are also being live streamed. Unfortunately, the, the, the online audience is, is not able to ask questions as far as I understand, but we appreciate that they're tuning in and they're with us. Um, to set the stage uh, for today's discussion, um, we are starting with a short video. Um, that explains why multilateral development banks take corruption very seriously, uh, which is of course what we hope. I haven't actually even myself seen a video, so I'm excited, and if I can ask the technicians to kick off the video, please. As the heads of the integrity offices for the major multilateral development banks, we mark International Anti-Corruption Day by recognizing the substantial negative impact that fraud and corruption can have on development projects and the people and communities who should benefit from them. Our offices work tirelessly to ensure that the funds provided by our development institutions are used only for their intended purposes. We strive to protect our projects and resources from fraud, corruption, or other sanctionable misconduct. There is a high level of consistency for the MDB approach on fraud and corruption, such as the fact that we have agreed common definitions. 
the MDPs have all adopted harmonized definitions of fraud, corruption, collusion, coercion that were included in the IFI Anti-Corruption Task Force Uniform Framework. Indeed, the six MDBs have agreed to common investigation principles so that we investigate the same things in the same way and we have an harmonized approach to referrals of possible criminal issues to national law enforcement agencies. We also have common approaches to other issues as demonstrated by our agreed principles on sanctions, treatment of corporate groups and settlements. Prevention is better than cure. Of course, the Asian Development Bank receives and investigates credible allegations of fraud, corruption and other integrity violations. But we also proactively review projects about which we have not necessarily received complaints. The aim of these proactive integrity reviews is to identify weaknesses and gaps in procurement, financial management and other critical processes that could increase vulnerability to fraud and corruption. Based on the review, we make recommendations that aim to strengthen the controls on the project. To promote transparency and knowledge sharing, we also publish a report with the key findings and recommendations on our website. Working together is crucial as a means to cooperate and strengthen the deterrent effect of each institution's investigations and sanctions regime. Five MDBs signed the Cross Debarment Agreement in 2010. This innovative initiative means that individuals and companies found to have engaged in fraud or corruption by one institution are debarred by the others. Since signing the agreement, more than 1,000 individuals and companies have been cross debarred. In addition to undertaking investigations into alleged fraud and corruption, we undertake proactive and preventive work to mitigate the risk of corruption and fraud. As a group, the MDB Heads of Investigation also meet together regularly to discuss common problems and emerging trends. We also share information on jointly financed projects or possibly involving the same types of fraud and corruption risks in different projects. We also liaise with and make referrals to national law enforcement bodies if criminal offences may have been committed. Our office at the EIB also works with Europol, the European Public Prosecutor's Office, and the European Commission's Anti-Fraud Office to ensure effective coordination and close cooperation on corruption and fraud possibly impacting EU funds. In a time of complex global challenges, our organizations provide much needed support to countries around the world. From health and education to transport and infrastructure, development financing invests in opportunities for a better future. And has the world struggled to manage problems like COVID-19, conflicts and climate change? The multilateral development banks are lending their support. On this International Anti-Corruption Day, we call on everyone from government officials to citizens on the ground to speak out against corruption. Together we can declare that corruption has no role in development. Together we can take a stand for accountability. Together we can work for a better world. Please join us. Join us. Machen Sie mit. Join us. Acompáñanos. Join us. Acompáñanos. Join us. Join us. Acompanhamos. So clearly, they're all very dedicated people on this ta uh, table, and I have no doubt that they're trying to do the best job in the world, but I think you also have a very difficult job because we know how much can go wrong and how many risks are there. So. I really want to want to have a conversation with you about not only the perfect picture, perfect theoretical ideas of a compliance and integrity system, but how, what does that mean, you know, in your daily lives, and how easy is it uh, for you to go about uh, this job? So, if we can go to the first slide, please. Very briefly, the case scenario that we're faced with. Um, I'm going to stand here because otherwise, I I turn my back to you. Um, we are we have a bank that's called very creative Dev Bank. Could be any of the banks here um, that typically finances uh, you know projects with a developmental objective, of course, with sometimes very low or even um, no interests. They are dedicated, or they have decided to finance a project in a country called Flumoria. 
um, which is, uh, doesn't exist, but it's a potential. A, a country of that kind is probably a regular client. It's a lower to middle income country. Its economy depends largely on mining and the energy sector and agriculture. It's a country which has had a steady growth, but uh, the wealth is highly concentrated in a few, and the majority of the people live in, in poverty and sometimes extreme poverty. And also we have a post-conflict environment, so everything's probably politically still fairly complex. Corruption perception index, okay. Not the worst, but certainly not doing tremendously well. Now in the capital of uh, Flamoria, there has been a river, or the river is still there, that has been terribly polluted through industrial waste, other waste, and that's one of the key projects of the Flamorian government in the context of environmental and economic recovery to clean up that river and, uh, and also uh, prepare for, for potential floods in a better way and therefore prepare, um, you know, protect its, its, its population. DevBank wants to give around 100 million loans, 100 million in loan to the country. The tendering for the work that is involved in cleaning it up and so on will be done through Flamoria's own uh, public procurement processes. So it's not the bank that's going to assign um, the, the, you know, the construction company. It's going to go through the procurement system of the country. And we should note that there is going to be one main contractor, and the contractor will rely on a number of um, subcontractors that will implement various things. And we're going to move on to the next slide already. There is a bunch of companies interested, some local firms, uh, a number of international uh, firms. Uh, the country, I should have maybe said that before, is known to have sort of, let's say, not the perfect separation of business and public sector. So some people may play a role in both sectors. And DevBank hasn't had only good experiences in the countries. There's been some good projects and some projects that were a bit iffy and maybe didn't quite uh, present the expected results. One of the companies that's interested in getting the award is Waterworks Group, which is um, a, you know, a company that has relevant, is, is a relevant company in the sense that they are specialized in water sector infrastructure. They've worked, you know, in other countries, but absolutely not in this country or in this region. Um, that's one point to consider. And the other point to consider here that's explained in a case scenario is that they are not a huge company, but they're very, very keen to grow uh, quite fast. That's the declared interest of the CEO of the company. Another company that is in the, in the mix is a local company called Conco. Conco. Consultation Corporation, which is a local potential subcontractor that has uh, experience uh, on DevBank projects, including in the country about which we're talking. So in that sense, it could be interesting because they've worked in this context. There are some rumors of ties um, to government ministers, so the separation between public and private here, not necessarily perfect. Um, before I turn to the panel with a bunch of questions about how they would go about this, uh, I'd be interested, you have three choices. Based on this information, it's of course a bit scarce. Would you award? Would you consider awarding the contract to the company WWG? Absolutely not, or maybe under certain circumstances. So who would absolutely, who would say, yeah, I mean, they seem qualified, good companies, they have experience in the sector, let's go for it. Oh, Dan, thank you. <laughs> Dan's the one who put the hypothetical case together. Uh, who would say, under no circumstances, these guys are just way too risky for me? Then you can't vote again. All right, so I guess the majority of the room, if not everyone, says, well, maybe some more thinking needs to go into that, right? Now, how much thinking, John, if I can start with you, would you put into this? How would you approach this project? What's the due diligence approach? What are the uh, considerations that you would give and what kind of information would you need in order to decide if you were sort of like, yeah, maybe, but hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, what, what we uh, need to bear in mind here is that it's a, a sovereign project. 
And um, while uh, effective due diligence is critical for the successful development of any uh, project, we, we do make a distinction between uh, the due diligence that we do in sovereign projects, uh, where we uh, finance, uh, where we provide a loan to a government to develop and implement a project, versus uh, a non-sovereign project where we would, we would uh, provide a loan to a private sector entity to uh, develop and implement a project. Now, this being a, a sovereign project, uh, what we typically do is we focus on uh, capacity assessments of the government. And that is because as a development institution, uh, we do not have the same latitude to choose a client, so to speak, as we have in our non-sovereign operations. In non-sovereign operations, we, you know, we do due diligence, and we can really select at the front door and not uh, work with entities that we uh, feel would expose us to elevated uh, integrity risks. So in, in sovereign projects, we, we very much focus on the capacity of the government agencies that we will be working with. And uh, the purpose of these capacity assessments is to identify weaknesses uh, in the uh, ability of the government agencies to conduct a fair and transparent procurement process and to uh, exercise effective oversight uh, during the implementation of the project and, and, and over the payments that are made during the implementation of the project. Um, the findings of these capacity assessments then feed into how we will actually design and implement uh, the project. In this case study, there are several factors that uh, indicate that we would consider this project as high risk. Uh, these include the fact that Flumoria has a, is a status as a, as a, status as a developing country uh, with a large dependence on the mining sector which tends to uh, lead to a heightened uh, vul vulnerability to uh, corruption in the public sector. The other factor uh, that was in the written case study, I don't know if it was in the PowerPoint, was that, that the uh, Flumoria went through a decades-long civil conflict, which uh, may have weakened the capacity of, of the government institutions and oversight bodies uh, in that country. Another uh, indicator, indicator of high risk is the country's low ranking on Transparency International's Corruptions Perceptions Index. And uh, the fact that there are habitual close linkages in uh, Flumoria between government officials and, and private sector entities. And finally, what would also be a significant red flag is that, that the bank is actually uh, at that time investigating uh, an alleged uh, bribery because even if a, uh, the investigation is in an unrelated project, it may be indicative of weak uh, anti-bribery controls uh, in the country concerned. Now, in high-risk projects of this kind, the, the bank tends to uh, exercise very close uh, oversight, uh, very tight controls from inception until completion of the project. And uh, we would typically require the use of standard bidding documents with very stringent and in, uh, integrity covenants and representations from the contractors. Uh, that would, for instance, then help us to identify if there are actually conflicts of interest, as the case study uh, suggests. Uh, we would set very clear parameters for the capabilities that contractors must have, and that would identify if Waterworld Group uh, does indeed have the cap capability, even though it's a company that it may be very ambitious, we need to see if it has a track record. We might uh, require the implementation of a supervision consultant, uh, or the appointment of a supervision consultant in the project implementation unit of the government to, uh, to uh, as a sort of an additional safeguard to, uh, uh, in the, in the, uh, to ensure the, trans the fairness and transparency of the procurement process. And uh, all along, uh, at key milestones of the procurement and implementation of the project, we would uh, require ADB approvals and, and oversight. Uh, let me stop there. Thanks. Well, it's, it's a voluminous kind of list of tasks that you have in a situation like that, so I completely understand. What I find is probably the key point here is that despite the fact that you're giving the money, I mean, the government's going to conduct the procurements, you're kind of very closely involved. You're not just giving it away. In every situation like that, you would be accompanying it very closely. Now, Paula, over to you, African Development Bank. 
there are obviously integrity issues in this key scenario, but there's also a social and an environmental component. How, how do you tie these considerations uh, sort of together? And, and, and how do you take into account sort of the developmental potential of a project like that? Thank you very much. Is it working? Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much for the question. Uh, at the African Development Bank, uh, the Safeguards and Compliance uh, Department carries out an environmental and social risk assessment for all the projects. Uh, so let us uh, just, I would like to indicate that there's, it is a different department who does this assessment. Uh, it is part of the assessment of all the bank projects. So uh, these uh, safeguards include rights, for example, to adequate consultation and engagement with and protection of vulnerable groups. We are talking about a country with vulnerabilities. Uh, it means that every project also has a project grievance mechanism uh, to allow also consideration of biodiversity, ecosystem services, process of compensations and resettlement of project affected people, including uh, vulnerability issues uh, in the context of extreme poverty. Uh, yesterday, we had men I mentioned that for the African Development Bank, we have a specific category of transition, which we call transition states which are exactly this category of states that uh, are in a vulnerability situation in terms of the governance, uh, in terms of uh, the institutions. We have a specific uh, facility for this type of uh, countries when we work uh, in the projects regarding this, uh, this type of uh, regional member countries. So these safeguards, social and environmental safeguards, also include uh, labor conditions, they include health and safety, and also oversight on SIA risks in the projects. In addition, the standard bidding, uh, bidding documents for the works includes uh, certain requirements. For example, there is a requirement for a performance declaration of the contractors uh, for the past three to five years which is, uh, will be determined regarding in, in line with the nature of the project. This performance also, there is a guarantee that is requested. Uh, it can be, it is 3% of the contract uh, value, included also a code of conduct that is uh, applicable, to, applicable for the contractor's personnel. So this is the safeguard in terms of the social and environmental uh, aspect. In addition, uh, we have a compliance uh, department which has the role, they have the role to conduct compliance reviews. What is a compliance review is to ensure that people's rights uh, to voice their concerns about projects being financed by the bank, for example, if uh, the African Development Bank is financing a project and the community, the local community that is supposed to benefit from that project has some concerns, they have the possibility to raise those concerns and we have uh, the internal department whose mandate is to provide effective recourse and remedy to individuals, to workers, to communities who feel that they are negatively impacted by the bank's finance project. So this conduct of compliance review is also uh, a problem solving through mediation between the bank and the local communities. Uh, I think that for now I'll stop here. Happy to answer to okay. questions oh. or comments. Thank you. We will connect back to, to what you just said, especially when it comes to receiving reports and, and you know complaints or, or feedback from communities. I'm just going to move over to Baron because you mentioned some of the conditions that you're putting in, in contracts, for example. What would be in a contract if you were to give that loan in terms of additional you know, obligations or, or guarantees or, or how can you make sure this is a, an enforceable stringent contract where improprieties should theoretically not be possible? Thank you for the question. Um, 
I think it's important to mention that this builds up here. So when we look at the project, as John outlined, right, we really um, execute due diligence in order to decide whether we enter into a project, we take on risks, we take on opportunities associated to a project. Um, when we think about the legal arrangements, that's really how we manage risks which might evolve uh, in the project life cycle. And so it's important uh, and it's a standard for us that we uh, would include um, so-called fraud and corruption clauses, uh, which um, are also labeled as audit clauses, which would allow us uh, in case uh, we have allegations around so-called prohibited practices, this might be fraud, corruption, coercion, and others, which are defined um, in, in our policies. If those occur, if allegations occur, we uh, would be, uh, you know, we would be um, empowered, we would be have the contract in place to really go on site and, and execute uh, an audit uh, of um, those project parties subject to those allegations. So that would be one. Uh, the second one uh, would be, and you mentioned, right, the procurement uh, process initially. Uh, we obviously um, do not, in that case, uh, I think uh, makes it fairly clear, trust in um, the local infrastructure, the local laws, uh, especially when it comes to um, procurement processes, we would um, hold the project uh, liable and accountable to our own procurement standards. So that is uh, a second safeguard. Uh, we call it the procurement policies and rules at EBRD where we would uh, have um, outlined the standards ensuring that the best bidder gets, um, gets the award. Um, and, and, and not just you know, those who are uh, the friends of some important persons in those countries. Um, part of that uh, second safeguard of the procurement rules is also that we would require the tenderers to sign a so-called covenant of uh, integrity. Uh, why is that important? Uh, this gives us um, another way if uh, tenderers would have mis misrepresented um, anything, and this comes up during the project life cycle, would, gives, would give us um, um, a foundation to hold those um, tenderers or those uh, project parties accountable. Last but not least, which is also an important element and safeguard, the third is around representation of evaluators uh, of a tender process but also of the tenderers as to whether they are subject to a conflict of interest, which is obviously also a key element in order to ensure uh, an objective uh, uh, awarding of, of contracts in the procurement process. Thank you, Bernd. I think what's, what's becoming quite clear here, and, and you kind of said it's building up, right? So we're, we're kind of moving our way through, through the scenario, uh, through what you live through every day. And I think what's really important is, in a way, this does sound like risk. That there are clearly risks in this scenario, right? Now, a normal bank might just say, yo, thanks very much. I mean, let's see. You know. But we need the multilateral development banks to be willing to give loans in higher risk environments. You know, we, we need that, and it's absolutely essential. And, and we do know that there are risks involved and we can put all the safeguards in them, the more, you know, the more the merrier, I guess, to an extent. But we don't want to strangle the possibility of investing and, and moving forward development projects. And I think that's really important because, you know, I, I wouldn't want to give those guys my money, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> and I'm glad you do it in, in, a, in an open-minded, but risk, uh, ri not risk-averse, but risk-aware uh, way. So I think... Um, that's, I guess, my main takeaway. We do need the multilateral development banks because otherwise probably nobody would um, invest. Is there a question or a comment? Yes, please. We can do that, absolutely, please. Um, Dan, can you bring the microphone over? Hello. Oh, it's loud. Can you perhaps just say who you are and... Yeah, sort of I'm Ben Schmidt. I'm a program officer at SIPE, the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center. I have a master's degree in development and so this is something of a passion of mine and I was thinking about the same thing that 
you were just des describing, which is the importance and the need to invest and provide investments in dangerous and risky environments, but at the same time, the need to set up controls and, and do your very best. And what I was wondering is, does the World Bank ever do kind of part one, part two projects where you you might say, okay, so it's 100 million. Part one, we'll, we'll do the minimum. We'll do 30 million and maybe we won't, we won't do the infrastructure yet. We won't do the construction yet. We'll just do, let's just clean the river. Let's, uh, let's deal with the pollution. And based on our review at the end, if, you, if the behavior is good, if the results are good, if, if it's clean, that unlocks 70 million to do the rest. Um, as a way to kind of like part one and build a relationship of trust and, and then the, you know, the, the country receiving understands that, you know, the, the, the biggest investment comes after we prove ourselves. That is a very, very interesting and, and good question. I should have thought of that. It's not in my <laughs> script. I'm not really sure if, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Repka. I'm from AIR, uh, which is uh, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. And my question is, building on Ben's question, um, to what degree or what appetite is there to use technology to potentially reduce that risk? So in that example, using things like the blockchain or, or smart contracts or geospatial analytics to be able to track projects and then pay out as projects are progressed. So after we have just sorted out my health and safety risk here, we can go back to integrity <laughs> risks. Thank you for your concern. Um, who wants to respond? I don't know if John or Laura, you, John, go ahead, have a first go. Um, I'll, I'll take the question on the sequencing of investments. That's actually very common. Um, if anything, uh, countries generally do not have the absorption capacity to actually take on the uh, whole string of investments that are generally needed as part of their uh, development planning. We actually have within uh, Asian Development Bank uh, something what we call a multi-tranche financing facility which really um, cuts up a, a big investment program into smaller discrete projects. And um, it's fair to say that generally no matter how difficult the project if we will keep on engaging but uh, there have been instances where we've had decided to reduce the scope of a project or the follow-on projects etc if we feel that uh, we're throwing uh, uh, good money after bad and uh, we we do need to uh, we need we're accountable for the economic impact of our projects and if we see that the country is not able to deliver we we generally tend to step back for a moment and see what we need to do uh, before we re-engage and and continue investing in the sector but I think it's fair to say we never turn our back completely on 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 the problems that we face. Um, so that's, in sum, the answer that we have on the first question. I, I think Laura also. Yeah, wanted I, to come I, in I and could add to that. that um, from the IDB, it, can you hear me? From the IDB experience, um, we do actually do a lot of phasing or sequencing of. Um, uh, different types of, of projects and you know the financing is, is sequenced that's often f more for technical reasons so that you know certain part of the project needs to be finished before the next or for financing reasons as you said not throwing uh, more financing than the, the country or borrower has the capacity to handle um, it's not necessarily done I think in the integrity context but it's an interesting question that you ask because what we do do not infrequently, is provide technical assistance to um, a, a particular agency or to a country um, or even to, you know, for a private sector project to make sure that the capacity and all of the controls and the requirements are in place before the big investment comes along. So I think that goes to your, to your question a little bit. And then there's the whole realm of uh, policy-based and performance-based lending where the money doesn't even get dispersed unless certain policy or reform conditions or, um, are, are complied with. So, so that concept is, is there uh, somewhat, but, but um, 
I think I think your your idea is an interesting question, and Duncan wants to add. Can I just uh, indicate that EIB is um, uh, issuing uh, green bonds um, in response to the air question, and uh, it's it's well known that EIB has issued a couple, I think, three or four, very successfully, of innovative bonds. Uh, that are not paper-based, but electronic-based, and uh, there's some significant uh, developments in the market. They, they do that with, obviously, with investment banks, uh, Goldman Sachs and um, banks from France and so forth. But I, I think, um, I think if, if you uh, had a look at EIB, there's some uh, very positive uh, influences there too. I actually think it's fantastic that you ask questions whenever you feel like it. We do need to continue because rather than bringing it all at the end, we do need to continue, but there's one more question here at the front, right? Just use my microphone for a sec. Thank you very much. I'm Hamid Sharif from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, I'm also head of integrity. Uh, but I have a couple of reflections. Um, one is I think it's very, cynic, it's very easy to be cynical about the space in which MDBs operate. And of course, these are very high risk environments. Uh, but there is some good which has come out of this. I was uh, head of procurement for many years in ADB, and I can tell you from that experience that because of the concerns around corruption, MDBs have actually played a superb role in professionalizing public procurement. So if you compare, if you went back 15 years, 20 years, and you look at the state of play today, many countries now have public procurement laws. Now, the laws are in place, that doesn't mean the capacity is in place, so you still have problems, but I think we are making, making progress. My other reflection is that if you look at, this is quite a typical sort of a case uh, which uh, MDBs would be dealing with. I also wear another hat in my current organization. I listen to complaints about violations of our environmental and social policy. And one of the things which unfortunately is, is in, everyone has got very excited about the inspection function. 30 years ago, we established that. I was part of a team in ADB, which wrote that policy. But almost 30 years on, what is disturbing is that while with one hand, we seem to be giving and empowering civil, civil so, so, society and project affected people, both on the environment side and on the, and the, and the anti-corruption side, where it's failing is that we don't tell the project affected people where they can complain. So if you look at corruption, you'll find that most of the investigations which we carry out come from disgruntled contractors. Very few of those come from project affected people who complain about roads not being built properly and so on because they don't know where to, where to complain. And I think this is a very important area which has to be addressed. I think maybe the other panelists can just also, while you're answering, while we're moving on, react to some of, some of these issues, because certainly from you, Paola, I got the impression that there is a possibility for communities and not only disgruntled competitors, but maybe we can kind of weave into a reaction to your intervention into, into the next round, because we do want to find out who got that contract. So we're going on to the next slide, and you will be incredibly incredibly surprised that the company did get the contract. So uh, WWG uh, did get the contract. Um, they also had a, a, an arrangement with Con Conco, who was a sub uh, subcontractor. Um, very quickly, um, allegations were raised. Now, I don't know if it was a disgruntled um, competitor or, or, or some, some, some other person, but um, basically they're very concrete uh, allegations, uh, not just sort of like, I think this is dirty, but sort of very specific allegations saying that ConCon basically asked WWG to give it money in order for them to bribe a public official with which they guaranteed they could make sure that WWG was getting the contract, but in return, they needed to be their subcontractor. Um, also allegations that WWG paid a consulting engineer working in the department that was kind of uh, drafting the specifications for the project so that it was in favor of WWG's own capacities. And last but not least, and this is where actually the complaints procedure here in terms of social and environmental issue comes in, there was a local community, people from the local affected communities that claimed that one of the walls 
broke, I guess, and, and led to massive uh, damages to their homes and their agricultural fields, which is basically all they had probably for a livelihood. So, Alan, if you receive that, you're not, you're not yet in the investigation stage, you're, you're hearing this, you know, what you do when you hear that, what's, what's your procedure, and what is the point at which you say we're launching a full investigation? And if I can add to that question linked to what was raised earlier, is there any moment at which you have to pause a project? If there is a certain threshold of allegations where you go like, whoa, this is, looks so bad, we gotta pause? Is that even an option? Well, well, the first thing is I'm glad they've been awarded the contract, otherwise at this end of the table we wouldn't have much to talk about. <laughs> but this is the other reality of the work that we do, and it very much touches upon the point that Hamid uh, made very eloquently, is that you know, as a lender of last resort in some very, very difficult jurisdictions, a completely different risk appetite to those in private sector banks, of course, or most private sector banks, I should say. Um, this is the, the risk that we face, and ultimately, um, despite all the sophistication of Bernd and, uh, and Paola and, and John and uh, all the excite, uh, excellent uh, uh, oversight they provide in terms of integrity due diligence, projects go wrong and complaints do, do come to us, whether you term them as submissions or complaints of, of misconduct. Uh, this is the, uh, the reality. So uh, within the World Bank, uh, just, uh, just very quickly, just to give you some, some context, of course, as the World Bank, it comes as no surprise that we probably have by far the most number of complaints, and that's just by dint of, of geographical sort of reach. Uh, 18 months ago when I arrived, it was somewhere in excess of 4,400 a year. Um, we did some work uh, on our complaints mechanism. In fact, we completely revamped it during the course of the other last year, and I'll talk very briefly about that and why we've done that. Uh, we now have, but still in excess of 3,300. That's a huge amount of data, and that's a huge amount of uh, intelligence and potentially a lot of, of risk that has been realized, and we have to do uh, something with it. So within uh, the Integrity Vice Presidency, so INT, I'll, I'll use the acronym of INT if I may, within the World Bank, we have uh, deployed, and it won't come as a great surprise to you, Greta, in, in many ways, and I know that the EIB probably followed the closest intake process to, to the ones that we've deployed now, but simply because of the experience of previous law enforcement, and that's true of Duncan and uh, his colleague Bernie, who you saw on the screen earlier. The reality is that we don't have the resources to look at absolutely every single, or investigate every single one. Every single complaint is certainly, or submission is looked at very carefully. Uh, it is analysed firstly to see if there is a mandate, whether it engages the mandate of the, uh, of the INC function, the World Bank. Uh, does it fall within one of the five sanctionable offences? So are we looking at fraud, uh, corruption, collusion, coercion, or uh, potentially further, further down the line, uh, some form of obstruction? So those, uh, in brief terms, and I can speak about it in that longer detail, but so that's what we're looking for in terms of what it engages. I would say approximately somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of that material is not <coughs> then subject to a complaints uh, mechanism, so a proper analysis and review. That doesn't mean that that information is simply dispensed with, and we just dump it in, in, the, in the trash or the garbage. Uh, actually, a lot of analysis is done on that work. We know, and this is, this is essentially the, the law enforcement model, the national intelligence model is, is one, probably a very well-known one, is that we subject it to a lot of analysis. We look very carefully at to where the, the matter needs to be referred. Often, this touches upon some of the points that Ahmed made and Paola made, uh, it engages uh, uh, environmental and social safeguard uh, issues. But what is surprising, actually, from our experience across the board here on this table is how many times an ENS is issue also at some stage, whether at the outset or later on, also has a fraud and corruption angle to it. So they're often sort of, you know, a, a marriage of, of, of convenience in many ways, but they are often similarities. So with the material that we, we, we have, we uh, refer a lot of it internally to other mechanisms other mechanisms within oversight mechanisms within the other World Bank, and of course there are many of them that uh, may be familiar to the audience. But for those that uh, remain with us, uh, and those numbers are still substantial, uh, we have now developed a, a, a complaint sort of checklist, which is really looking at the indicators. And the reason we have a very uh, a, a robust checklist in excess of 50 indicators now uh, is to sort of look strategically at where we need to be putting our resources. And we're looking for impact for certain. Uh, we're not simply looking at the lowest levels of, of complaints, which uh, we, we will stu still do something with in terms of deferring and raising as risk uh, and potential risk within the, the institution. 
Uh, and then we will do uh, some analysis that may take three, four, five months or so uh, to look at whether the complaint is then ready for the purposes of being opened as uh, a formal investigation. So this is, this is a really robust process. Uh, with the material that we don't then subject to this complaint assessment, this is fed into our case management systems, and this is where we come back to the tools. I think Air made a very good point about the tools that are available to us. You can imagine that we're talking about millions of documents across the World Bank, and the World Bank is good for many reasons. One of them is the huge amount of data that exists. That intelligence is then, in a sense, matched across this. We can't do that at a human level. This is where we deploy uh, AI, for example, and we have a, a fantastic panel that's being prepared, I think, is it tomorrow or Friday? Friday. Uh, a, a really interesting panel on uh, artificial intelligence, model profiling, looking to see where, where the, those triggers are and where those uh, instances of interest are to us. Uh, it just can't be done by the human, uh, by the human eye. And so we have to deploy some of these uh, um, new, new developing uh, uh, tools. And the idea is then to, to then reflect this back into, sometimes in real term, and this answers your question that you posed, uh, to work then with the operations uh, those people, the, the task team leaders, for example, who are really at the sort of the coal face of working in these sorts of environments that we have here. So we're seeing risk. I mean, what we see from this huge amount of intelligence that we receive is risk. And we identify the risk where we can map it and map it to projects. We, we then will work very quickly and very closely with our colleagues. Now, on occasions, that has led to real-time uh, interventions. Uh, our colleagues either mitigate the risk by making changes to a procurement process, for example, if they're still in that bidding phase. On occasions, it can, and it has led to a misprocurement uh, being, de uh, being declared. So our aim is not to stop projects. The, the aim is to identify the risk and, and then try to mitigate it. Yeah. And ultimately, what we're looking for, uh, Greta, is, is impact. And let me just finish quickly with the, the question that was raised by AIR about tools. This is a new environment. Uh, I mean, what we're doing now, the sophistication is now increasingly being deployed by all of these MDBs, requires that we keep, keep up with uh, new tools. AI is one of them. Now, you mentioned geospatial uh, location uh, tools, things like that. That is something that both within the operations they are starting to use, and we recently have started to deploy. Another advantage of the, of, of the mechanism that we have to assess complaints and submissions is looking to feed it back into proactive investigation. So recently, on a case example, very quickly, we've used geospatial locational um, technology to look at a road uh, in a particular jurisdiction to see, one, whether the road has actually been built. And these are in environments that are almost impossible to get to. Uh, and also because of the, the sophistication of the technology, just if the road does exist, uh, the quality of the road, you know, how deep it is. And actually, you know, the sophistication allows you to actually get down to square meters to see whether the right materials are actually being used. And this is the sort of new area in which we're getting into. So thanks, Chris. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think what the two points you made, I just want to make sure that we don't forget them. They're really important. On the one hand, even if a complaint may not be pursued in a full investigation, you use it to analyze and, and basically further improve your systems. And I mean, it sounds obvious, but it also binds resources. You know, The reality that you may not be able to pursue every single case and that you look at both the risk, but also at the impact of if something goes wrong in this project, it would be worse than if something went wrong in that project. And I think that's also something that I hadn't actually thought about, but it makes a, a lot of sense. Now, Duncan, Mr. Investigator, <laughs> take us through sort of the key investigation steps that you would do. And uh, I do have to remind everyone we got to be sharp. Sorry. So based on the case intake analysis that Alan's uh, arrived at, uh, we've got a case, we're going to look at it, we're going to investigate it. But let's be clear, we're not law enforcement. We don't have law enforcement powers. This is an administrative process. It's not a criminal law process. We don't have search warrants. We don't have arrest warrants. We do have some contractual powers to ask for documents and to request books and records be inspected in relation to the project. And those are very useful in terms of what we're trying to achieve. But let's be clear that this is not a criminal investigation. Now, having said that, most of our teams are staffed with experienced law enforcement people who know one end of an investigation from another and know how to get what they're looking for. So despite, in many cases, the fact that we don't have those law enforcement powers, we do find material that's useful. We do find evidence of fraud and corruption, and we can take sanctioning 
cases uh, through the system because we've got the evidence. So uh, the investigation is is important. It's not as easy as potentially it could be, but we have what we have and we have the powers that we need to see what we can find. On this sort of a case, we'd start with the complainant. The complainant normally knows more about it than has been included in the first allegation. So we'd like to get back to them and find out what they really know, what the full extent of, of the wrongdoing may, may be or the circumstances in which this complaint is being uh, made. We'll talk to the complainant or, or complainants if there's more than one. We, we may um, talk to the affected parties. We talk to the witnesses, the people who are affected by this, the losing bidders in the procurement process, the people who are implementing the project. You know, let, let's get a, a clear a clear picture of the of the dates, the chronology of what's happening, and there are some, many, who have the motto "Follow the money," and if it if that's possible, that's a really good way to do. Sometimes that's not possible, um, but nevertheless, we investigate on the basis of what the information and documents are available, and having talked to the implementation implementing agency, it may be possible to interpret what's happened through the, de through the dates and any other uh, systems that we, we talk about. Um, obviously, once we've got gathered enough information and, and evidence, this is evidence in the form of testimony, so people's written witness statements producing documents formally uh, for the purposes of their um, ability to, to talk to these documents, then we would interview under caution uh, the, uh, the, the suspects, the, the people who may have paid bribes, the people who may have received the bribes, the people who, who may have distorted the technical specifications. And we, we do that on tape. We do that to record uh, the, the conversation and make sure that they don't claim that we misunderstood what they said. And those, those tapes are transposed. We, 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 uh, we write those up and we have a full and accurate record of what they say when we ask them about, about the circumstances that we're investigating. And then we have a clear picture and then we have a lot of documents and a lot of evidence that we can decide on whether to take forward the case into a sanctions case. And I really want to get to the sanctions, so I appreciate uh, you being so 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 uh, short. But Laura, just a quick question to you also with regard to the investigation: Would you would you would your office uh, investigate both the sort of contract-related allegations and the negative impact um, points in this in this situation? Well, thank you, thank you for that uh, very interesting and enticing uh, question, Greta, and um, thank you to the audience for being here and to the IICC for organizing such an excellent event. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to engage on this. Um, on, on to your question then, uh, we would definitely look into all allegations of prohibited practices and any and all information that is potentially relevant to those allegations. In these types of cases with more complex technical matters related to execution of the works, like um, what happened in this example, the investigators would typically coordinate with the project teams to hire an engineering consultancy firm, for example, to conduct an in-depth analysis of the technical aspects of the, the wall, in this case, of the, the case that we have before us, to determine what the reasons were for its failure. Remember, the wall, the wall failed, the retaining wall. And then we, our investigators, would look at, you know, whether this was the result of some sort of fraud in execution, was a misrepresentation made about the quality of the materials, was a misrepresentation made about the standards of construction and so forth. And in this case, if you read the more detailed scenario, you might have noted one of the facts we were given was there was a determination that the company built the retainer wall at less than the required depth, and that's what brought about the accelerated deterioration and the erosion. So it does look like a case for fraud in execution. Um, the investigators also determined that the company had made misrepresentations in its own reports, and the um, execution agency had also made misrepresentations in its supervision reports about these same facts. So what do we do with these investigative findings? Of course, 
as you were just alluding to, we would bring a case forward to the sanctions system. But I also would like to emphasize as loudly and clearly as possible the importance of prevention. We need to have the strongest possible enforcement mechanisms, but we also need to prevent and mitigate any further integrity risks for the project. This is a fundamental part of what we do. Uh, we need to take lessons as well to prevent these occurrences in the future from an integrity t standpoint. So what would we do for this particular project and in this instance in the, in the immediate term would be to do things, for example, trying to bring in an independent supervision firm to take over some of the project unit's responsibilities, increasing the level of supervision um, by the bank itself, uh, safeguarding new contracting procedures that are needed to complete the project or remedy the substandard works, and so forth. So yes, we absolutely would look into how to minimize the negative impacts of the project and also for the community that the project is intended to benefit. Thank you. We're going to go continue with the investigations. I don't just want to check if someone from the audience, Hari, in the back there, Dan, can you give the micro? Do you have the microphone? Can you? Thank you. Just take one or two questions, and then we want to continue. Okay. Um, uh, this is a great panel. Um, by the way, my name is Hari Mulukudla. I uh, have a small consulting outfit called Streamhouse, uh, working at the intersection of anti corruption and uh, technology. Uh, so, one thing I must say, all of you guys came to the panel, so I have to give you the credit. This morning I went to a panel, there was only one guy, four of them didn't show. <laughs> so <laughs> um, my question is these MDBs, uh, you guys have a lot of data, right? As you said, Alan, um, you get data from consumer, um, from complaints and uh, bidding information is all with data. You also mentioned AI. The issue with AI is it needs a lot of data. As you've seen recently with the chat, GPT, and these large language models, they do well if you, are, if you feed them with a lot of data. Um, all of you have so much data. Is there a mechanism to share the data across MDBs? And when you do share it, do you have concerns of privacy, confidentiality, potentially conflicts of interest? So all these issues are going to be uh, problems of the future. So thank you. Thanks very much. There's Quick, very quick question, and then we will stop the round of question again. Thank you, uh, Lou Epperstone. I head up the anti-corruption team at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So I've got a question about one is at the sort of country diagnostic level, the extent to which, in the different banks that we have here, you are using your country diagnostics, which should cover governance of corruption vulnerabilities, and how that then filters down through your procurement and contracting processes. That's question number one. And then question number two is the extent to which you use tools like beneficial ownership transparency into your procurement and contracting to hopefully identify some of these risks. I appreciate that works better in some contexts than others, like potentially this country might be quite difficult, but I'd be very interested to hear that. And then I had one final question, um, which is around at what point, if you find that you do have evidence of bribery or corruption in a procurement case, at what point do you pass that on to law enforcement and how does that happen? Thank you. You're preempting one of the questions. Now you make me realize I should put my glasses on because I didn't recognize you, very embarrassing. Um, I will move on with my questions and I, can I ask the panelists if you feel like one of the questions you can integrate that yes. into, your, into the next round of questions because I do want to uh, come to you, Paula, and it kind of connects with one of the questions at the very least. And we were talking about well, what are some of the... We heard, Alan, like, we want to check a, a road, but it's impossible to get there, so we use geospatial technology. Like, what, what are some of the, the challenges and difficulties your investigators face? Thank you very much, and thank you for the very interesting questions also. So, um, before responding, I would just like to indicate, Duncan has uh, explained and indicated that we are conducting, we conduct administrative investigations, so we don't have powers of a law enforcement agency. I think it's very important to have this in mind. But another aspect which is very important, because in the last question, I heard the word evidence evidence, which is key also for MDBs, because our standards of proof are not the same in terms of 
evidence. Our standard of proof is more probably than not that that staff misconduct or sanctionable practice has occurred. So I would like to, I wanted to just uh, flag this. It's very important in our investigations. Uh, now, going back to the challenges. Um, in this particular case, I think that it would be difficult, not impossible, uh, but some aspects. Uh, there's absence of nexus between WWG and the alleged bribe recipient. Uh, if the bribe was transmitted through Conco, it's going to be difficult. If Conco does not cooperate, it will also be difficult, but we have other means, and then we have also all our MDBs have the whistleblower possibility. So perhaps a whistleblower anonymously will also accept to come forward and bring some additional information uh, and elements that would be helpful for the investigation to continue or for us to be able to uh, have a strong case. Lack of cooperation. Inability, I believe that uh, it is also uh, another challenge is the potential interference, intimidation uh, by government officials in the investigation. Uh, lack of cooperation of witnesses. In a post-conflict environment, uh, we do have challenges in terms of poor infrastructure. Our investigators very uh, professional and very hard workers investigations at the Afri investigators at the African Development Bank they always go extra mile uh, working in sometimes very difficult conditions uh, but we do have uh, uh, the reality of uh, sometimes the location is just not accessible because it would constitute a security risk for our investigators so it is a challenge, but uh, we try to work the best we can. Um, for the time being, blockchain is not yet applied, but maybe uh, in the future, not only blockchain, but um, uh, how do you call it, um, drones, perhaps will help us to have access to those difficult locations. Um, Nelson Mandela used to say that it looks al always impossible until it's done. So, dream, it's allowed. Excellent. And I believe that dreaming would allow us also to, to reach to some uh, uh, positive reality. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, extreme poverty may affect the cooperation of witnesses, mm -hmm. especially knowing uh, the senior of uh, knowing that uh, if they know that a senior official mm -hmm. is behind conco yep. okay. and the second part of the question regarding emergency uh, yep. if quickly quickly covid during covid our investigations continued of course it's not the same thing interviewing a witness virtually <laughs> than in person in person, you can read the witness. You can see the, the body language. You can analyze and you can take time to really examine each detail. It's not the same thing virtually, but we need to be resilient. We need to adapt because our world is now becoming digital. So we did continue, but it is not the same thing. Conducting investigations virtually is not easy. Thank you. But it's probably better virtually than in person, but with the two masks in their face, because then it's even worse, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you were talking about cooperation and the need for the company to cooperate. And, and I want to ask you, John, like how do you actually get a company to cooperate? Or how, how do you incentivize a company to cooperate? Indeed, that, that's that's quite a challenge. As as Duncan already said, we we don't have uh, the compulsory powers that uh, police uh, officers typically have, so we need other ways of seeking uh, the cooperation. Now, first of all, we we do provide a carrot in a way to to companies in the sense that if companies make a voluntary disclosure of having been involved in an integrity violation, uh, either deliberately or 
or inadvertently, which also happens, um, we have under our policy the possibility to, to waive or, or, or mitigate uh, the sanction uh, for those parties that come forward in, in, in good faith. Unfortunately, the practice shows that that's quite rare. It doesn't ho happen very often, and, and that's where, as Duncan also alluded to, we, we really need uh, uh, in, in the documentation, in the legal contracts with any party that receives ADB financing, either directly or indirectly, the right uh, to investigate uh, when, when allegations uh, arise. And again, if, if, if parties uh, cooperate uh, in good faith and proactively that will uh, reflect favorably at the time that a, a decision is made uh, with respect to the sanctioning it may lead to a shorter sanction and conversely when uh, when a party is is not cooperating it may be actually lead to a, a a longer sanction because it can be considered as an aggravating factor if a party is really uh, 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 so uncooperative that it becomes obstructive we actually have a separate definition in our prohibited practices, which is an obstructive practice, and you can be debarred for, for that by itself. We do generally uh, very uh, careful to debar solely on obstructive practice, but it, it, can be, it can be done. I just want to use one minute to speak to the country diagnostics uh, question, if that's okay. So we have what we call governance risk assessments, which go at three levels. We, we, do, uh, we look at the country level, what is the political economy, in the case of Flumoria, the fact that there are uh, generally a lot of linkages between government officials and, uh, and private sector would be, could be identified, the fact that it's low on the corruption perceptions index, that's at the country level risk. Then we look at the sectors that we operate in the, uh, in the country concerned. And here we're looking at flood protection. And uh, I was myself involved in a flood protection project in Bangladesh. And this really speaks to the phasing question that was raised earlier too, is in a, in a subsequent uh, 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 project that we did with respect to flood protection in, in Bangladesh, we actually uh, included additional mitigation measures with respect to the works that take place underwater. There was a lot of sandbagging involved. Uh, protecting the, the river banks with sandbags. And in the, in the earlier phase of the project, there wasn't adequate oversight of the contractors. And because it's quite hard to drop a sandbag at the right place, a lot of them were just emptying their boats and be done with it and get paid. And it didn't really achieve what the project was, uh, was uh, supposed to achieve. So we, we uh, made sure that there were divers actually inspecting uh, whether sandbags were, had been deposited at the correct place. So there is this kind of learning going on from the sector. And then at the project level, we would identify in this particular uh, scenario, we would see are there at the, uh, ministry, of AI, uh, at the ministry, are there conflict of interest uh, 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 provisions, declarations required from government officials with respect to their uh, uh, associations with, uh, the, with the private sector. The sandbag one is a good one. Uh, I'll come back to that, actually. But, um, Laura, the one thing that I'm always uh, interested in as well is, and, and not only in, in multilateral development bank cases, but generally also in foreign bribery cases, you know, run by, by national law enforcement agencies. So you go after the company, and you, at some point you will potentially find out which of the public officials got bribed. Um, do the governments uh, care about that? Like, do they do something about it? And if they don't, <laughs> what do you do then? I might not quite respond to the question about whether they care about it, but <laughs> <laughs> I do think this is a, a great question because it gives us a chance to talk about two of our strategic priorities, which are prevention, and I've already talked about that a bit, um, and cooperation, the importance of collective action, with many, many speakers uh, at this conference have, have addressed that as well. Um, and the organizations at this table it, this goes to one of the questions that was asked a moment ago, have very important and fluid mechanisms for mutual cooperation and exchange of information. There was a question about data. Um, we do exchange uh, investigatory information. We have the ability to do that um, through our agreements. And uh, we have extensive exchanges on experiences and practices, uh, which is uh, extremely valuable. Um, and that has been on the investigation side, but then also 
uh, much more now on, on prevention uh, mechanisms as well, and in the private sector work, which we haven't spoken too much about, which our offices also, many of our offices are responsible for and the due diligence practices we have there. Um, so there, there is uh, information exchange that's quite extensive amongst us. And in recent years, a very important part of our strategy has been to develop formal and informal cooperation and information exchange arrangements with uh, national agencies. And this was another question that was asked with, uh, for example, at the IDB, uh, cooperation arrangements with national prosecutors, with anti-corruption agencies, with competition authorities. So, to get to your, your question, in a situation in which we know or suspect that a public official has engaged in corruption on one of our projects, we could share that information with local authorities or even make a formal criminal referral, uh, going to your question. We, um, at the IDB, and I believe all of the, all of the uh, organizations represented here have similar policies, um, we, we may make referrals if we believe that local law has been violated. And there's no, you know, we evaluate it uh, at, at the IDB on a case-by-case -case basis. I think each of us has a, a bit of a different practice, but um, I think that that's a very important tool. Uh, so to your question, what if no administrative action is taken to remove the official, uh, any legal action by local authorities either doesn't happen at all or takes a long time? In those cases, our immediate priority would be to work with uh, the bank staff and management to limit future risks to the project or to other projects that we have that might uh, be affected by the same person and to limit uh, the exposure to any public official who might be committing corruption. Um, these could include, for example, we might work with the executing agency to um, ask that the public official be removed from any duties associated with projects that we finance, even if they're going to remain in their position. Um, we would promote reporting mechanisms among staff of the implementing agency so that, you know, that's always a good prevention mechanism. Adopt more safeguards to keep the public official from having a role in procurement, payments, and so forth. Um, and very importantly, looking to strengthen the supervision and controls within the project unit, such as requirements to bring in an independent supervision firm. We talked about that on one of the previous questions that would oversee procurement activities and other duties that are typically carried out by that official or by, by those agencies. So our priorities would be to take action with the information that we have, to share it with other entities that might be able to take action, and always, always to insulate the project from any additional integrity risk. Thank you. I hope they care, the, go the governments. <laughs> and uh, give me, let me, I'll give you a chance in a second. I just want to talk about one more aspect because we, we spoke about the need, uh, for example, Duncan spoke about working with the complainant as part of the investigation process. We talked about you know the need, and, and you referred to it as well, for communities to be able to come and speak or people affected. And, and of course, the word whistleblower comes, comes into mind. So what kind of protections can you possibly offer to, to, to a, an affected person or possibly an employee of the, of the company that's in, implicated? So what, what means do you have? We have a whistleblowing policy. Um, however, it is uh, more difficult and um, partly not possible to apply the whistleblowing policy to external parties. Um, the whistleblowing policy is really directed to um, and I should specify, obviously we apply it in a sense that we take in um, information of whistleblowers not being part of EBRD, that's clear. But the way we can protect um, with uh, interim protection measures or protection measures uh, to protect the whistleblower against retaliation is limited to the extent that uh, this is just possible for employees of, of EBRD and to contractors which uh, work on behalf of, of EBRD. And I think that, that limits to a large extent, uh, but um, this being said, I, I think we should not forget that uh, we are not only open and, 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 and keen to, inf to, to get uh, information via the whistleblowing hotline and whistleblowing channels uh, beyond the hotline, we also can do something about, um, which is not 
maybe the same level of protection, but it goes without saying that um, the whistleblowing works in a confidential manner. Um, and, and, and in addition to the confidentiality, um, we are very clear with our partners, with uh, you know, the project uh, partners, that we are not accepting any form of retaliation. Um, and that could again lead to um, um, a prohibited practice which is subject to uh, investigations on our part. Uh, we already mentioned coercion, um, but also um, fraud could be something uh, by you know, going back to what I said earlier, the covenants we have put in place in the contract that um, these covenants include that um, project companies are clear about that they would not retaliate um, any, 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 in any form um, whistleblowers. So that could again be so say misrepresentation and could be leading to an investigation. The last point, uh, real short, is the independent project accountability mechanism. I think that's important to mention that's an, as a second independent function next to the compliance function, which I represent. Um, a colleague of mine reporting into the board, uh, into the highest, so to say, governance body of EBRD, um, will assess these kind of allegations and will hold the organization, EBRD, accountable as to whether we have lived up, lived up to our own standards when it comes to environmental and social standards. And uh, that, that is a very public process. And very often we also have a so-called dual um, mandate matter, which means that we would investigate next to our colleagues in the uh, independent project accountability mechanism. Well, now I've just definitely learned something new. Um, and I wrote it down, I'm going to research that, but I was just realizing and reflecting on the fact that you do have, in a way, on the one hand, certain means to engage and, and tackle these issues that are very unique and maybe special and, and beyond what a national enforcement agency can do. And on the other hand, you obviously have, have also really, really clear limitations. And, 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 and I think it is really a different scenario. I was just wondering, John, if you might want to upgrade your carrot into a brownie or something, and then, and then we can talk again. But talking about brownies, I do hope you allow us to potentially go a, a few minutes over max. I mean, we're still in time, but I do want to talk about the sanctions. And uh, uh, so there will be still brownies outside, I promise, or I hope I can promise, uh, even if we go a couple of minutes over. But I want to take the two questions and we will address them in the final round when we want to talk about what actually happened to the company or what could happen to the company if they're found guilty. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> my name is Natalia Jovanovic. I'm from Belgrade, Serbia. I'm a reporter there. So you mentioned that you collect a lot of evidence and that you do assessment uh, of various problems that you receive. Is that a publicly accessible information? Can we as journalists access those evidence and those assessments in some cases that are in particularly interesting for the public? Because clearly there's like a public interest to learn something about it. I will let you react to that, but integrate it perhaps in, in another answer. It's, a, it's an interesting one because we also talked about sharing information and this is, it goes beyond sharing among the banks. One more question here and then we'll Thank you. Um, I'm Andrew Mendoza, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, in reference to Paula's comment on uh, evidence and standards of proof, and in reference to Laura's uh, intervention on uh, national referral, uh, is how do MDBs deal with this? The difference in the standards of proof, which is more likely than not, and the levels of criminal uh, prosecution, which is more higher than, than more likely than not. Is there a, an attempt from the MDBs to filter what you refer to national uh, agencies uh, before you refer it? Uh, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Um, I actually gonna spoil the beans. We don't need the next slide. Company's gonna be um, confronted with the findings and admits that indeed, oops, maybe we didn't quite play by the books. And, um, and it enters into a settlement agreement uh, with the Def Bank. So that's the end of the story. Not quite. Um, but I will slightly change my order because I do like Alan perhaps to come in in, in relation to that last question because I was going to ask you 
whether there should in this case be a referral to national uh, authorities or law enforcement and uh, and when do you make such referrals so maybe you can combine those two yes thank you there must have been some collusion because Andrew you you've asked the same question in a sense so <laughs> and, and I'll also take the question from our colleague from Serbia as well, from the other journalist. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, the investigations remain confidential right through the, the phasing, the various phases that we discussed, particularly the, the complaint development, right through the investigation phase itself. If there are settlements that are being negotiated with the entities or the individuals, those are also uh, sensitive and confidential and not uh, publicly available. The first moment, I guess, for, for a journalist pers perspective or civil society is when the announcements are made, the formal declarations are made of the, the sanction itself or that the settlement has, has been completed and finalised and it has been approved by the various mechanisms uh, within, within our respective MDBs. So that's the first stage at which um, uh, the broader sort of uh, civil society and journalists will, will get to find out about it. Now, there is a mechanism, so coming back to law enforcement, slightly different uh, there because we have the ability, of course, and this touches very much upon something that Lara started to, to speak about already, where we suspect that a national law has, has been uh, uh, infringed, and you spoke about, Gresha, about sort of the payments of bribes, public officials. And then we have uh, the, the mechanisms across all of the MDBs, actually, and we'll, we'll, we will have slightly different practices, actually, in this area. Uh, we can make a referral to law enforcement. We can make even an interim referral earlier in, in the, the proceedings uh, or the investigation phase, if we think that's appropriate as well. Um, Andrew touched upon the fact that there is a divergence or a difference in terms of our civil standard, in terms of, uh, of evidence, as opposed to the, uh, the criminal standard. That, that is not a concern for us because uh, that is a matter for the law enforcement agencies themselves. What we hand over to them, even if we get into a position where we hand over substantial amounts of, uh, of, uh, of material and evidence to them, is for them to really trigger a criminal investigation. So they use it as a, as a platform to build a case. Uh, what they do with that material and how they then sort of formulate it, particularly using their compulsive powers, which as Duncan quite rightly said, we do not have, that's a, a matter for them. And so we work quite closely with, uh, with a lot of these uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, in the last few years, we've routinely, within the World Bank, within INT, referred about 10, 11. Uh, last year, we slightly made a, a change because, again, with this uh, greater emphasis on impact, we want to be ensuring that with our limited resources, we are engaging with... Uh, law enforcement authorities that we know will take these matters forward or have an, an interest in doing so. Um, not, not all jurisdictions necessarily uh, will, will actually take us up on the offer of, uh, of, uh, of, of you know, our referrals. Um, so we take a, a little bit more of a strategic approach to it. And if I could just give a very quick example, um, to just to illustrate the point, it's a very quick example, and it goes back to my time working with Greta in the International Centre for Asset Recovery. I was a technical advisor to the Anti-Corruption Bureau in a Southern African country. Uh, we received a letter um, from actually the EIB, so Duncan's boss, Bernie O'Donnell. Uh, he knew I, I was there working with them on a very serious allegation involving um, public officials within uh, a water body in, in the jurisdiction. Now, the EIB funding was at risk, and it was very significant amounts of money. Uh, as an illustration of how this works, the letter was, was sent to me for me to share with the head of the Anti-Corruption uh, Bureau, which I did. Uh, we analysed the intelligence that was came, contained within it. We asked for more material, which came back within 24 hours or so. Uh, on the basis of that, as the law enforcement agency in that country, from the first letter, uh, within 10 days, we had drafted the search warrants. Uh, the EIB team came in. They came in with forensic analysts because we also seized at the same time as we executed the search warrants laptops and phones. We didn't have the capability at that point to do the forensic analysis. So EIB sent a team... Uh, within 10 days, and we executed the other search warrants. Within two further days, we executed then uh, the arrest warrants for the public officials who are involved. And that's a very uh, expedited example. We can't co uh, quote too many of those, but we do work very closely. I just wanted to give you that illustration as, uh, as, as, a, as an indication of how it can work, how it should work in a perfect world. Uh, but as I say, from our perspective, and this addresses the point that many of you, I'm sure, know, is that our limitations are um, in the sense of the demand side of corruption. We can only extend our jurisdiction, and, and as formidable as it is, 
up to the point of those who have been involved in the handling of the, the proceeds or the, the financial uh, products of the, the bank itself. And whilst that list is long, it doesn't extend to the public officials, apart from very exceptional circumstances, which we can speak uh, outside the other room. Uh, but the demand side we deal with by looking at referrals and strategic referrals to good law enforcement agencies who will then uh, run with that material and then launch their own criminal investigations. Thanks. And the only reason why we forgive you for speaking one minute longer is because you talked about our cooperation with Duncan, right? <laughs> so, Duncan, over to you. The company has entered into a settlement agreement. Would that have been the case with EIB? Absolutely. Um, we have a sanctions process. We have what's called the exclusion policy. EIB is not a party to the cross-debarment agreement that you've heard some, some talk about. EIB does not have the same immunities and privileges as the other banks. So for legal reasons, we have not signed the cross-debarment agreement. We remain interested in it because the requirements of the covenant of integrity that one of the, the former speakers mentioned is applicable to us. We use a covenant of integrity and one of the requirements of that is a disclosure of a previous sanction by another MDB in another case. So we are looking to see whether or not we can rely. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, exclude the bid. It just indicates to the, the implementing agency that they need to keep a closer eye. If this is the best value for money bid, then they need to keep a closer eye on, on, the, on, the, on the way it's being implemented. Um, so EIB is not a member of the cross debarment agreement. Uh, but under the exclusion policy, under section 12 of the exclusion policy, we can negotiate a settlement with a company that's engaged in wrongdoing. And indeed, we have negotiated on a number of occasions uh, settlement agreements with Siemens, with VW, with GE in relation to some Alstom power companies. And there's a number of others uh, listed. They're all listed on the, on the EIB website. So if, if you're interested in that, please take a look. Now, if you're interested more generally in the approach that we take, there's a very interesting article published by the Basel Institute. Last December, we, we wrote a joint article with Siemens, um, and it was published um, on December the 9th last year, ahead of um, International Anti-Corruption Day. And that's an interesting article because it describes the various processes that Siemens had to go through and the sort of things that they're doing now to take responsibility for what was happening previously. Mm. Now, let me just quickly, if we've got time, go mm. through some of the common requirements uh, for a settlement. One minute. We, we, we require the company to admit the wrongdoing. So if that's not a possibility, then we're not interested. We want a voluntary period of exclusion, like a debarment. It's, as I say, it's exclusion because uh, it's EU related, but mm -hmm. it's basically the same as debarment. We, we seek a financial contribution. This is not a fine, they're not paying the money to us, but a financial contribution to integrity projects in the, in the geographical area where the wrongdoing was, was um, um, uh, undertaken and an agreement to publish uh, a summary of the, um, the terms and conditions under which the negotiation has been settled. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't go to a full declaration that you are looking for in, in, the, in the media, but EIB would be um, uh, conducive to disclosing that, only that segment, because the terms and conditions of the settlement itself are confidential between us and the company but hopefully the, the settlement agreement summary or the, the press notice is sufficient. Now, along with those um, various bits and pieces, we, we may require some sort of conditions in the, in the settlement agreement. We may require the company to settle civil and criminal uh, uh, cases that have arisen out of the misconduct. Mm. That's not, nothing to do with us, but it's indirectly mm. related to what, what we're looking at. Um, on another footing, we may seek to have the, the company that's trying to claim to have turned over a new leaf and moving forward 
uh, with integrity to, to claim certification for, for ISO 37001, an anti-bribery standard for a company that may have paid bribes in the past, is a very clear indication, like an outside monitor monitoring the company, to say, yes, they're doing what they claim to be doing in terms of um, turning over a new lease. So those are the sorts of things that we look for in the settlement agreement. You know, I really wish we had had that half hour extra, which we were promised at the beginning, because I have about a million questions to ask you, Duncan, and, and I just want to make sure that we actually look like we are a bit collusive here ourselves with joint articles and joint investigations and having worked together, but I would rather qualify as excellent examples of collective action, which, which I think these institutions actually are, and that does bring me to, to my last question, which I think is incredibly interesting, and I don't actually think that many people know about it, the famous cross debarment that was referred to. So very quickly, Paola, how does that work? Because it's tough on companies and it's a real good weapon you guys have. <laughs> very quickly, right to the point. Cross debarment was signed in 2010 among World Bank, African Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, European Development Bank, Asian Development Bank. We are set? Five. No, but I, I mentioned all. EBRD. <laughs> <laughs> so this cross department means that in uh, a framework of an investigation that was conducted, and we are clear and sure that there was a sanctionable practices or practice or, or as the other colleagues mentioned, it's prohibitive practices, meaning fraud, cor cor corruption, collusion, obstruction, and coercion. These five, if one of our banks debars an entity or an individual, it means that that individual or entity cannot benefit from a financing uh, from other MDBs. This is what it means. Uh, these debarments or cross debarments are not eternal. They are time limited. And sometimes they have a condition. For example, the sanction can say that the entity is debarred for a period of two years with the condition that that entity will get um, necessary, will take necessary measures to include, to have an integrity and compliance program with a conflict of interest policy, with a code of conduct, code of ethics, uh, all those requirements that we uh, have common standards to say that this entity now complies with integrity standards. I think I was uh, short. Thank you. Standing, thank you so much. All right. One last question from Ms. Gemma. No, it's not collusion. She just <laughs> works with me coincidentally. <laughs> Thank you, Greta. It actually goes to the cross debarment. And the question is this. Where there's cross debarment, it can mean that the company is also then debarred by the EU. If it's debarred by the EU, it can be debarred from its national procurement as well, which can, in fact, be the death of the company, which isn't necessarily the aim of your sanctioning um, mechanism. So how far do you take into account the fact that that may occur through cross department as a knock-on effect. I think there was one more question that I didn't want to stop, and then we will, yeah, there. And maybe you want to ask Gemma's answer Gemma's question, and then we'll we'll take your question first. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Albert Lee Halaha. I'm with the Independent Integrity Unit of the Green Climate Fund. Uh, you've reflected a little bit about how you uh, work with organizations to try and remediate after they get into the uh, uh, debarment. But um, I'm very curious to understand um, what is the criteria that you use to determine whether a referral to national authorities is warranted as opposed to working with them through the remediation process. And, and then also, uh, I know most of you, if not all, are accredited entities of the Green Climate Fund. Uh, is there a mechanism that you will employ to discuss those referrals with the organizations such as the Green Climate Fund through the contractual uh, agreements and obligations? So if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that a little bit more, that would be uh, very helpful, thank you. Do you want to start, Paola, with the 
cross department question. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Now, in the cro cross department, this uh, agreement is among the multilateral development banks here. But your question is very important. Uh, I believe it was Byrne who talked about the due diligence process that we conduct, for example, before we enter uh, into a fair in terms of the projects. Those sanctions that you are mentioning, uh, they are different type of sanctions. We have administrative sanctions, we have economical sanctions, we have political sanctions. So I believe that in terms of the multilateral development banks, we are in the category of administra administrative sanctions because we have specific mandates, specific mission, and we cannot interfere some uh, of us in terms of our mandate. We have some, uh, um, there's a framework. So these sanctions are important in terms of to which entities are we entering into the projects, but I think we have some differences in terms of uh, MDBs, not in the framework of the department uh, per se, of the uniform department that we apply in a uniform manner. But in terms of the EU sanctions, I believe that it ca can be some differences among our uh, different uh, multilateral banks. Hope I clarified a little bit. Can I just actually quickly turn to Bernd because we are talking EU and EBRD is has an E as well. Do you want to add to that in terms of like how far do you go until maybe you want to save the company from complete bankruptcy? <laughs> well, I should clarify here is the Mr. EU. I, I'm, I'm just European. Um, but uh, but uh, clearly, yes, that, that is not the objective, right? As, as, as it was pointed out already, uh, we want to develop uh, and we want to uh, enable development and we want to call out issues and want to remediate issues uh, if they occur. But obviously there are, I think, uh, also uh, substantial issues which we uh, cannot kind of uh, remediate ourselves or we will need to conclude this is um, a different level of, um, of, of, of fraud and corruption which uh, might lead to other conclusions. But um, with that, I hand over to Mr. Yu. Uh, I have very little to, to add to what Bernd just said, but I think it's about what the company has to think about. It's not our responsibility to, that it's been excluded, and maybe there's some uh, indirect consequences for that. It's about what the company did, and on those facts, the exclusion committee or the debarment committee consider what is an appropriate sanction. Now, how, the, how that uh, um, uh, spins off into, into the EU, I'm not sure how that necessarily implicates uh, the, the company, mm -hmm. but I think, I think what, what the MDBs are thinking about is what is a, a responsible um, um, approach to the sanction of that company for what it did and the bribes it paid. Mm. Okay. And that's basically the only consideration. Uh, the company is the one that's responsible for how it's, where it's based and what it's... Okay. Four. Alan, do you want to? Yes, yeah, so I'll just finish off on this one and answer Absolutely. the next question, Please shall I? I, I don't want to stand between there. anybody and their brownies, so let me just uh, answer. So, so, I mean, Gemma, it's an excellent point, isn't it? I think years ago when these uh, functions were created, uh, INT just celebrated its 20th uh, anniversary uh, last year, I think. Uh, no, this year. Um, it was about debarment. It was about the enforcement aspect of it. I think the evolution of, of our processes has now led to further sort of much more nuanced thinking. And, and part of it is around how to ensure that these companies, because many of these jurisdictions need these companies back, but back in a way where they're actually complying with international standards of, of, of integrity compliance. So this is where a lot of us have developed now these fairly sophisticated processes of engaging with companies. And the entry point certainly for, I, uh, for INT debarments or World Bank debarments uh, is three years with conditional release, which means that we work very closely with them to ensure that they comply with international standards of integrity compliance so that they can return back to the market. And, I, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. There are, of course, entities who do suffer eventually to the point where they, they lose the business, but this is part of the deterrence aspect of it, and uh, those are very, very few examples. Many actually return back into the fold, and actually, surprisingly, the recidivism rate is not particularly high amongst these entities. So, 
a, a good job is being done in ensuring that they return back into the in, into the fold. And then, if I may, Greta, very quickly, just responding to the you know the question from our colleague around uh, the referrals to law enforcement. For us, again, the first consideration is: do we believe that there may have been uh, an infringement of a national law? Uh, we're not experts in every single jurisdiction in the world, so we it's a fairly sort of broad brush approach. But there's a lot of expertise across the across the other teams, and that is the entry point for us. Obviously, INT particularly has a lot of MOUs with law enforcement. We've signed one already this afternoon. There will be more before the end of this uh, week is out. Those are, uh, those are law enforcement agencies who want to cooperate with us, and they, they want to do so because they know that we have this referral uh, program. So uh, we will do some careful analysis on who we're referring to, uh, but one of the criteria, uh, amongst a number of criteria, sort of reference points will be, is it somebody that we know? Do we think that they're going to uh, take this material forward and actually execute the, prob the problematic area for us, which is the demand side of corruption, and particularly where the role of public officials uh, is beyond uh, our reach. So th there, is a, there is a strategic way in which, which it's done, but that's the entry point uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, I'm sure you're going to stick around, and if people have sort of additional questions, uh, come up, and the others can go out and pick all the cookies that are left before the carrots are brought out. But, uh, yeah, which I promise I might go out through the back door now. <laughs> no, but I really want to want to thank you and um and and um you know I think your your work is just incredibly important but also uh, incredibly complex and it has so many uh, elements of limitations to your work yet other opportunities the 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 the, the balancing of the risk of wanting to avoid by all means you know bad things happening but the money also needs to go to these countries and people will will benefit from it and so on so it's it's quite it, it is really a fascinating I'm kind of thinking about changing careers now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> seriously. Um, if you want to read more about what it means to promote integrity in international uh, multilateral development banks, you can read uh, Duncan's books. And uh, But seriously, I mean, if you have additional questions, we don't have time now in the group, but you're welcome to come up and ask those questions directly. <laughs> okay. No conflict of interest here. <laughs> no, but thank you so much uh, to our panelists. You've been fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, being here.